so many psychologists do what I deplored psychiatrists doing. They, were, they use diagnostic labels to attach to people. And these diagnostic labels come out of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. The DSM is quoted by a vast number of people, not just psychologists and psychiatrists. Lawyers use it a lot. Medical in, uh, insurance, health insurance uh, companies use it. Now, the DSM, it's bigger and bigger every year, is a document that is reliable, but it's not valid. All psychologists should know the difference. Now, when, say, a decision is reliable, what that is that the people who've made that decision go on making the same decision reliably. For something to be valid, there has to be evidence of that thing separate from any statement. So for all the diagnostic labels in the DSM, for them, for them to be valid, there has to be proof outside the DSM. And there isn't. There's no chemical change that causes any mental disorder. There's no gene that's been shown to cause any um, psychiatric or mental disorder. The DSM is reliable, but it's not valid. Now, what you could set up here every time a group comes together is that we, as a group, every month could have a discussion about whether the moon is made of green cheese. And every month we could decide reliably that the moon is made of green cheese. Every month, a reliable decision. But does that prove that the moon is made of green cheese? No. No. So, the DSM is reliable, but it's not true. Now, some of my psychologist colleagues, I've heard them say, oh, well, you know, we, we have to use, use the, the, this in our reports. You know, we, we have to give um, our patients, our clients, um, a diagnosis. The psychiatrist expects it. The lawyer expects it. The medical insurance company expects it. So that's what we use. I used to say to them, well, that's all right if you're going to use it, but please don't believe the DSM. But I, I wouldn't say that now because I find so many of my colleagues here and in Australia believe the DSM. The doctors who worked for the Nazis, you know, in the concentration camps. I think it was 1932. Hitler wanted to start a euthanasia, so-called, program to get rid of all of those adults and children who had what we now call special needs and to get rid of all psychiatric patients. And so the, this was where a number of doctors experimented with quick and easy ways of killing people. And this was where they developed um, the, the, the gas chambers. And so once this scheme got underway, many thousands of people were being killed by the doctors. But these were all patients in a hospital. They had families who expected to receive a, um, a death certificate. And so these doctors, after they'd given a lethal injection or supervised the use of the gas chamber, uh, would have to 
uh, sign death certificates and they used to make up illnesses like pneumonia and burst appendix and they'd put these imaginary diagnoses on the death certificates. Is it totally different from using a diagnostic phrase as a label, a diagnostic label, to write a report for a psychiatrist. Is that totally different from making up a, a possible a cause of death when you know that it wasn't, that wasn't the way the person died? I find in reading uh, Robert J. Lifton's account of his long interviews with um, Nazi doctors, psychiatrists, is the way in which these people gradually changed. It wasn't, with so many of them, it wasn't suddenly being a good doctor and overnight becoming a wicked doctor. They just kind of got used to the system so that when they ended up working at Auschwitz, well, you know, got to get rid of these people. That's one of the great dangers of flying, that we can slide along a dimension and not be fully aware of what we're actually doing. As I always say of my, my profession, they never use a single syllable word if a multi-syllable word will do. They've always been tremendously fond of abstract nouns. Now, abstract nouns have no reality. Abstract nouns are just ideas in our heads. If you've read my book, you know I've written a lot about extroverts and introverts. But the words actually used by psychologists, other than myself, is extroversion and introversion. There's no such thing as extroversion, no such thing as introversion. But there are people who are extroverts and people who are introverts. But more recent times I've been reading about all these wonderful bits of the brain that are, this is the new phrenology, um, where uh, bits of the brain are being lo located, uh, being shown to be the location of things like sociability, assertiveness, religiosity. Oh dear. Now, those are all abstract nouns. To, to arrive, you know, a common noun is pinned to reality. It talks about a thing, like chairs and people. Um, but an abstract noun starts off with reality and then a person abstracts some ideas from that situation. So abstract nouns reside in the brain of a person who's done that process of abstraction. It's a move away from reality. It's a move away from what's actually going on. But if you're a psychologist, you can spend an awful lot of time measuring something that isn't there, like intelligence. I was one of those psychologists who had, had to give masses of intelligence tests. And I never found intelligence, although I did find an awful lot of intelligent people. They were real but intelligence wasn't real at all.